This episode of Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Inside the Breakthrough, a new history of science podcast full of did you know stuff. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Welcome to a classic episode of Diabetes Connections. Always so glad to have you along. We aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. These classic episodes are a chance to revisit episodes that aired in the first and second year of the podcast when, frankly, we didn't have quite as many listeners. And it's always fun to go back and check in with these folks. I spoke to Jeremy Larson back in 2015. He has traveled the world and he is currently living in Japan, as he was when I first spoke to him. He started a project that he called 7130, the perfect, quote unquote, blood sugar range, to show that type 1 diabetes shouldn't hold anybody back from travel. Jeremy was diagnosed with type 1 when he was nine years old, and he says he got the travel bug from his parents. And he's from America. He's an American citizen living abroad. And he says he spent a lot of his childhood seeing the U.S. from the back of the family car. He has been all over the world, and you can see from his many, many videos where he usually shows his blood sugar, talks about his management. He, he's far from a perfect guy. That's not the point. He says, as you'll hear, it's more just about getting out there and living well with type 1. A little bit more on what Jeremy is doing these days. I'll catch up in just a moment. But first, this episode of Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Inside the Breakthrough, a new history of science podcast created by Symar. Symar is a group of Canadian researchers dedicated to changing the way we detect, treat, and even reverse type 2 diabetes. The latest episode features the question, does snake oil actually contain snakes? It's a look into how this phrase, snake oil, came to be, and it was kind of surprising. It's a little gross, but it's also very interesting. I got a sneak peek of this show at the beginning of the year. I love it. I've subscribed to it. I listen to every episode. They're all terrific. Search for Inside the Breakthrough wherever you found this podcast. And if you're listening through the website or on social media, there is a link to Inside the Breakthrough at diabetes-connections.com. And this podcast, as you know, is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. When I reached out to Jeremy Larson back in 2015, it was because I was just really intrigued by his Twitter feed. He was traveling all over the place and he was always showing his blood sugar. And he had interesting stories about everything that you would we would expect, right? Finding insulin, language barriers. We, we talk about that a little bit, you know, talking about what saying type 1 diabetes in different languages. It was just as fascinating to talk to him as I had hoped. And we actually connected again a couple of years later. He did a huge road trip across the USA in 2017, going to different national parks. I think he talks about that in this interview that he was planning that. And when I caught up to him recently, he said, hey, I'm actually still in Osaka, Japan, still teaching, although we're watching the coronavirus numbers with concern. He had to cancel big Amtrak travel plans last year. He has been biking to and from work every single day, and he has a big YouTube channel. So I will link to that now as well so you can check out what he's been up to. One more quick thing. I need to let you know my intro to this interview initially, the beginning of of my talking, had a lot of music under it. I did things a little differently back in 2015. So it'll be really weird if I play that now. It'll sound odd. So I will just set it up to tell you that at this point, Jeremy is talking to me from Japan. I am in North Carolina. And I'm starting out by mentioning the time zones here. I thank him for joining me today. Or maybe it's tonight. Tonight, my time. Early morning, your time. (laughs) Let's start. Um, when you were diagnosed, you were a kid, you were living in uh, the United States, you grew up in the Southeast. How old were you when you were diagnosed? I was nine and I was living in Augusta, Georgia. I don't remember a lot about it, except that my parents say I was uh, laying around on the couch a lot and had no energy and all that kind of stuff. Um, drinking a lot of water, going to the bathroom a lot. But I think it was the lack of energy that really, really concerned them. And as I recall it, and I was only nine, I'm not sure how accurate this is, but I recall that they took me to the hospital on December 24th. Oh, no, so December 19th, mm-hmm. so just a few days before Christmas. And uh, I don't remember exactly what happened, but I remember somebody, probably my dad, saying, uh, well, they think you might have diabetes. And I had heard that word. I knew it was something, but I didn't really know what it was. Right. So I was in the hospital for several days, you know, and of course it was diabetes. And... um I remember them 
saying the doctors were real good uh, and they were saying they weren't sure I was going to get out for Christmas morning, but they were trying to do that and I didn't really care. I just wanted to get better. <laughs> and finally, they let me get out on December 24th. So oh, we wow. actually went home and had uh, some kind of Christmas morning the next morning. So that's kind of all I remember. I remember a few things from the hospital, but um, it was just basically pretty, probably the pretty standard story from back then. Yeah. Um, when you're nine years old, you kind of just want to get back to your your friends and if you play sports and just doing what you want to do. Mm -hmm. I remember I, some of my friends at school had given like um, Christmas presents to each other and somebody had given me a box and it had like a giant candy cane in it. And I was kind of looking forward to getting back to that. <laughs> And my parents had thrown it out. I was oh, pretty no. upset about that. Do you remember kind of life changing quite a bit? Or did your parents treat this as, okay, we're just going to go on as we did before with diabetes? No, that's exactly how it was. They just, uh, they were real great. They were obviously very concerned and everything. But um, they kind of presented a uh, just, well, that's how it is kind of face to me. And that's just how it was. I don't really remember a difference. But I don't remember what life was like before it. You know, we're going to talk a lot about travel today. Did you yes. have that bug as a kid? Did you travel with your parents a lot? Yeah, that's where it started. Um, I didn't. I wouldn't say I had the bug, but uh, we lived. I grew up in Nashville. Actually, I just moved to Augusta when all this happened. But when I lived in Nashville, Tennessee, and when I got uh, when I lived in Augusta, we would take these long car trips once or twice a year down to Sarasota, Florida. And you know, especially from Nashville, that's whatever it is, twelve or fourteen yeah. hours. We do it in one straight shot. So it was me and my sister and my parents, and um, we would just spend you know, me and my sister in the back seat playing <laughs> games and looking at license plates and all that kind of fun stuff. And we just got used to sitting for long periods of time and watching the world go by. And we drove all around. Uh, we drove around to Mississippi once and just long, long car trips. And I think that's where it started. It's funny that you mentioned the license plate game and things like that, because I travel a lot with my kids. We drive in the car, but they've got their movies and their iPads, and they don't. I hope they look out the window sometimes. <laughs> oh, I don't think they do. <laughs> I still play the license plate game when I'm driving around America. <laughs> but you don't. Wyoming. Wyoming. <laughs> but you don't live in America anymore. How did you get to Japan? Well, I had only, I was still living in America, and I had only left the United States once, and that was for a month in Scandinavia. And that was a lot of fun, just backpacking around, you know? Did you go by yourself? Were you with friends? Yeah, by myself, wow. yeah. And that was just just kind of learning how to travel, how to be outside the U.S., and how to find trains, and how to find accommodation and stuff. And it was a lot of fun. But then I was back in the U.S., and I was working uh, in Augusta, actually in Aiken, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I started, I don't know what the thing, what made me do this, but I started realizing I could I could not even, not only travel overseas, I could live overseas somewhere. And I thought, well, how would I do that? So I started looking at um, websites and stuff, and I found out you could teach English. And you didn't really need any special qualifications, depending on the country. And there's a lot of different countries you could do it in. So I decided to go to Chile, because I was pretty good at Spanish in high school and college, and I still remembered most of it. So I thought, I'll go to Chile and I'll be a teacher. And it turns out you had to have a teaching certificate or some kind of degree or something mm. for Chile, the Chilean government's um, rules. So I looked around and then I kind of settled on either Japan or Korea because they had a good reputation for having um, a lot of jobs and you didn't need special qualifications and the salaries were pretty good, even for introductions, introductory teachers. And then Korea kind of had a bad reputation. I don't want to smear Korea because I don't actually know. But they had a bad <laughs> reputation for uh, some of the schools didn't pay on time or wouldn't pay. Uh. And Japan had no such uh, reputation. Everybody thought Japan was pretty good. So so I actually I applied through a website to one of the big companies here in Japan. And they flew, or I flew up to Toronto to have a uh, an interview. And they hired me, and a few months later, I came to Osaka for one year. My plan was one year, maybe two, and it ended up being four years. And then I left Japan after four years, went traveling a little bit, and then I came back to Japan. I've been here another four years. That's where I am now. What do you like about it? I mean, did you enjoy teaching, or do you just like being in Japan? My mother always told me that I should be a teacher, and I always thought she was crazy because I, I never did anything like that. Like I was in, I worked in newspapers, and I worked in like graphics and stuff like that. 
And just because that's what you do if you want to move here, I started teaching English. And it turns out I do like it. It's uh, it's not really why I'm staying here, um, but it is fun. It's very – it's like, you know, most people have desk jobs where they just sit around and they're on a computer all day. But my job is just talking to people, and it's really a lot of fun for that. So the reason I stayed was kind of um, – it's just – to me, it's like traveling every day a little bit, because as I don't read Japanese that well, I don't. I'm not actually that good in Japanese, despite my time here. So whenever time, every time I walk down the street here, everything's kind of weird and new to me. Still, it's still that way, and that's what I like about it. I like a little sense of uh, I don't quite know what's going on, so I kind of have to fight to to you know make my own way here. And I'm kind of used to it, but still, it's it's an odd place to be. It's the, the the people like me who thrive here are generally people who are probably more loners, or they probably uh, they just enjoy they enjoy the the uh, challenge of trying to figure things out. It must be just so fascinating, as you say, to feel like you're traveling every day. But we haven't really mentioned type one diabetes. Tell me a little bit about how you do it. Especially, let's let's back way up. Tell me about your first trip, that month of backpacking. It it seems like this is second nature to you now. How did you prepare, mm-hmm. and what do you do when you travel? Um, it's kind of funny when I look back on my life, like because I was diagnosed at nine. When I think of you know the rest of elementary school and junior high school, high school, I don't really remember diabetes. Like in high school, I don't remember if I took shots to school and took them, or if I just took regular in the morning. I don't know what it was because mm. I just had like a regular life, and and I always, almost always, tried to maintain diabetes, but I didn't really. Uh, it wasn't like a huge, huge, huge thing. It was just something to deal with, you know. When I was in Scandinavia. All I really remember is that I, I had my glucose machine, and I was on uh, Humalog and probably NPH. Hmm. Yeah, Humalog and NPH at that time, and it was um, insulin pen with replaceable cartridges. That's what I was using, and I ju- it was only a month, so I knew exactly how much, or I knew about how much I would need, and I made sure the doctor gave me probably two or three times that amount just to be careful, you know. Right. And I kept it in a cooler pack and just carried it around with me. I remember I carried a an empty Coke a Coke bottle, like an empty plastic bottle, and I would put my used uh, strips and needles in it. Yeah. Just carried wow. them around for a month, and it got like all this bloody water and stuff in it. <laughs> oh, and I remember crossing over from Sweden and Norway by train, and the some lady came by to check passports and stuff, and she saw that. She just looked at it and didn't seem to care. Put it back in my bag. Said, "All right." <laughs> But that's got to be the most suspicious thing she's seen all day. Exactly. As long as you have enough uh, supplies, and all I'd have is insulin and, and blood sugar machine and strips, just make sure I have enough. I'd keep them in a couple different places, like two different bags, in case something happens to one. So it's not ever been any problem, really. You know, it's it's interesting to hear you speak about it because you're very low key about this. Obviously, you're taking care of yourself. You're doing what you need to do. But this, I like that you don't remember what you did in high school. To me, that shows, hey, it's just life. We're getting through it. I mean, I don't remember all the stuff I did in high school. I don't have diabetes. It's just the way yeah. it seems to go for you. Is that attitude, you think, something that is important as you live now in Japan? Yeah, I think so. Again, it never really comes up here. Um Actually, the re- I, I don't exactly know why, but I think one of the reasons, and I don't know how cool of a story this is, but it is true. When I was in the hospital and when I first got diagnosed, I remember, you know, it was kind of a heavy atmosphere, like you've got diabetes a little bit. And I remember the doctors saying a couple times, well, you have diabetes and that's not good. But the kid in the next room, he's got leukemia. Oh, jeez. And another word I had heard, I didn't know what it was. And they explained that's much, much, much worse, you know. And I kind of think maybe, because I eventually learned what leukemia was, and I kind of think maybe that's what gave me my um, outlook on diabetes. Like, it could be much, much worse. I think it's fascinating. You know, I'd love to talk to more people about their first impressions because I think it's very important. I don't doubt that that did affect you. When we were in the hospital with my son, there was a nurse who came by. She wasn't our nurse. Um, my son was not yet two years old when he was diagnosed, and we didn't know what we were doing. Well, what, what is this? What's going to happen? And she came in, um, and she has type 1. She was pregnant with her second <laughs> child. And she said, I just wanted to come in and tell you everything's going to be great. Life's going to be good. Um, they told me I couldn't have kids. Here I am with my second don't baby your son, get out of the hospital, have a great life, you know, see you right. later. And 
it affected us to the point where we thought, oh, great, look at that. I think if we had let ourselves kind of wallow in the woe is me and nothing's going to be good ever again, it would have changed. But this great nurse came by and said, ah, come on, it's going to be okay. Yeah. It really A lot does of people do outlook. wallow in it and they, they don't have anybody like that. And I think that sets them on a bad course. This is on a bad attitude, you know. I think we were extremely lucky. Um, so, Jeremy, now that you have traveled and you have traveled extensively, um, you started a really interesting project that I want to talk about, and that is um, how I saw you on on Twitter. This is your your Twitter handle, and tell me about seventy one thirty. What is this all about? Seventy one thirty. Uh, it arose really because those are the numbers that the American Diabetes Association re- recommends for pre meal blood sugars. Right. That's so, the best yeah. range. The best range, for generally speaking. I think 70 is a little bit low for me personally, but that's what they say. So it's got a good ring to it, 7130. Um, what happened is I knew uh, another diabetic, type 1 diabetic, and he didn't take care of his, I guess he took insulin a little bit, but he didn't, t- like, he got sick one night. Like, he felt really bad, and he called his father, who is a physician. And he said, I feel really bad. And his father said, well, can you check your blood sugar? And he said, no, I don't have any, I don't own a machine. And I heard this story and I mean, whatever that story has worked out all right. But I thought, and he's had a couple of surgeries for like uh, diabetic retinopathy and stuff like that. Wow. And I thought, why do people do that? Why do people just not accept it? Like it, life is so much better if you take a, a few seconds every every few hours, whatever it is, to check your blood sugar and try to get it right, you know. It's going to be real high and low sometimes, but just try to try to learn more, you know. The the psychological barrier that some people have of not being able to to um to face it is very unhelpful. And I'm, what 7130 is really to me, for one thing, it's a way for me to brag about the traveling I do because <laughs> I like that. Uh, and I like blogging and stuff. But um, it's a way to show people that you can go anywhere. Diabetes doesn't have to hold you back. And if you watch your blood sugar and really like, you know, accept diabetes, accept that you have diabetes and that's just how it is. And it's not that big a deal. It's not that hard. It doesn't always make sense, but it's a pretty simple process to take care of it. If you do that, you're more likely to do fun things. You're more likely to whatever your thing is, if it's traveling or if it's uh, getting a certain kind of job or living in a certain place or whatever it is you want to do, sports or something like that. So just, it's really all about checking. I know a lot of people are or knowing your blood sugar and maintaining it. I know a lot of people are like aching to find a cure. They just want a cure. Like I'm, I'm fighting to find a cure. And I like the work that people do, especially the JDRF. I think they all do really good work. But I think psychologically, I'm not so worried about a cure. If it comes, that's great. But there isn't one now, so I have to deal with it now. And this 7130 project is um, a video project, a picture project, too, where you're basically taking pictures of yourself and your meter, whatever the number is, and sharing them. What's what has the reaction been? I love the videos. I think they're they're really fun. And a lot of times, almost all the time, you have a pretty good number. Do you? I, I, I shouldn't get ahead of myself here, but do you wait till you have a good number to stick it in the video? It depends on which one it is. There's different <laughs> things. Um, there's one I did called uh, Osaka A to Z. The point of that one, which I made a list of 26 places around Osaka. This is while I was living here working, so I couldn't be traveling. I was right. kind of stuck here. So I made a list of 26 places around Osaka from A to Z, and I went to each one. I took a picture of my blood sugar machine, and those I did do some cheating on. If my blood sugar wasn't good, I would uh, <laughs> I would drink juice or take some insulin and wait a little bit, or I'd just pull up a fake number. You would not. I would, yes, because the point was the, the the finished product. So I had like all these, I think, yes, 26 places, and I think they were all between 70 and 130, and that was the point. Right. After I did that, I thought that what happened was the feedback I got from people. People said they liked it and found it inspiring that I was getting out to these places and stuff. But people were saying, how is your blood sugar always perfect like that? And I kind of realized, well, that is kind of annoying because it's not even true. So the next one, or one of the recent ones I did was when I was in Europe for four months, uh, I just said, well, whatever it is, this is what it is. And I'm going to go to the top of this hill in Budapest and take a video or a picture. And whatever it is when I get there, that's the blood sugar. But I'm still here and I'm trying to do my best with, with my insulin and my food and exercise and everything. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But I'm still here anyway. I like those better. Because <laughs> go, right? Just go. Right. 
you can you can stay at home and have a blood sugar that's 350 or you can be traveling through the Czech Republic now which is better <laughs> what has surprised you with about traveling with diabetes and living in Japan with diabetes anything really surprised you well living here the big difference between living here is how easy the healthcare system is it's nothing like it is in America and I remember, you know, when I was in America, I had insurance through my employer and all that and the deductible and which doctor you could see and all that kind of stuff. Um, none of that exists here. I pay monthly into the, the nationalized health service, health, health system, and I can go to any doctor. Or they can write me a prescription. I can go to any pharmacy. Everything's really like the prices are all set. Uh, doctor visits are really cheap and the insulin costs about the same as what it does in America, but it's just no worry. There's no health insurance worry. That's fascinating. Is it is it all the same supplies? I do you have access to everything that you would have used in America. Yeah, actually, somebody asked me today on Twitter um, what kind of insulin, what kinds of insulin are popular here, and I didn't really know what to say because I only know what I use, which is um, uh, Humalog and Lantus now, and those are actually manufactured for the Japanese market here. Like my pens actually have, are written in Japanese on the side. Oh, So they're very, I mean, yeah, even if I, if I go to a doctor and then like a brand new doctor and then they write a prescription and I go to the pharmacy next door, the pharmacy will probably have Humalog and Lantus in the refrigerator there. And if not, they can get it within probably 18, 24 hours. Have you ever been in a situation that your traveling kind of led you to um, a difficult situation with diabetes? You have to have forgotten a bag someplace. Um, well, nothing like that. Nothing where I was just out of supplies and couldn't find any because I'm so paranoid about it that I always make sure something's going to happen. Um, I've like my longest trip so far was about 300 and I don't know, 330 something days, about 11 months in Southeast Asia. Wow. And I took enough insulin with me for about maybe two or three months. So I had to buy it several times while I was on the road. And in those countries, like I was in, I, th I ran out in Thailand and I was in a small town in Southern Thailand and I thought, well, what am I going to do? And I went to the local, like the prefectural hospital or whatever it was. And I talked to this doctor who spoke English for some reason. Hmm. And she said, I said, I need a uh, Humalog. She said, well, you can't get Humalog here. You can get it. There's a private hospital over on the other edge of town, but it's whatever. It's like expensive. It was like $40 a pen or something like that for some reason. And I was really budget traveling then. I didn't have $40 for a pen. So she said, well, you can buy this stuff called Act Rapid here. Mm. And I said, well, what is it? She says, well, it's fast acting. It's probably good enough. And I, so I said, well, how much is it? And she told me and it was like dirt, dirt, dirt cheap. But it's a real kind of insulin. So I bought a bunch and it was really cheap. And it was kind of a test. And I said, if this works, OK. And if it doesn't work, I have to go home oh, or back to Japan or something because I won't be able to continue this. I mean, if I can't find the insulin I need, the trip is finished. And I have no problem with that because diabetes is priority number one. But it worked fine. And um, so I got lucky. So I had bought a bunch. Now it's good for another three or four months or something. Mm. And then I was in Cambodia and I went to, I was in the capital of Cambodia, Phnom Penh, and I needed some more insulin. And I knew in that region, Act Rapid was the, the most common. So I went to this pharmacy, I think it was like on August 31st, because they had pins, they had Act Rapid pins in the in the refrigerator and two, two boxes of five pins, so 10 pins. So that's good for about three months or something. And I said, great, I'll take them. And they said, oh, oh and then I noticed the uh, ex expiration date was oh. that day. Oh, so these no. are expiring today. So I was kind of thinking he would go and go into the back and get some others, you know. Right. And, he, he, and then the guy kind of looked at me and he kind of lowered his voice and said, would you take these for half price? <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> and I said, absolutely, I would. <laughs> and again, it was just, I'll try it, you know. And uh, those worked fine for the next three months and just things like that. I've, I mean, I've always, if I can't find what I need, I would cancel a trip, but that's only, that's the closest it's come to happening. And that wasn't really a big problem. So I've been lucky or I just being careful. I, I pro probably a little bit of both. I would think too. I mean, you know, if you're packing that well as you're traveling and I think we also forget diabetes is not an American experience. You can get supplies right, right, around yeah. the world. Right, right. 
Yeah, when I was crossing over from Cambodia into Vietnam, it was this strange little outpost of a border crossing, and not many people used it. And they were looking through my bags and stuff, and they found a bunch of syringes and pens and stuff. And they said, what's all this? And they didn't speak any English, and I didn't speak any Vietnamese. And it was kind of – they were kind, but they were, they were friendly about it. But they were – it was – obviously, they weren't going to let me through. And, and finally, I remembered I had a phrase book, and I got it out, and the word diabetes was in the phrase book. So I showed it to them. I showed them the Vietnamese version. And they all started like smiling, going, oh, OK, OK, OK. And they said, well, you know, they zipped up my bag and told me to told me to go ahead. Wow. So even the, even they were very, very suspicious. But as soon as they learned it was diabetes, they're like, fine, fine, fine. Go ahead. That's great. Probably a better reaction they get from the TSA sometimes in this country. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like they, what's yeah. this? Hey, so how I, I put you on the spot here. How do you say diabetes in, in Japanese? Diabetes is tonyobyo, which means uh, I think it means urine sugar sickness. Mm -hmm. That's what they call it, tonyobyo. What's your advice for people who are worried about travel? My advice is that almost all of the problems in the worry are psychological, and it has nothing to do with diabetes. I actually, I actually think, to get a little philosophical about it for a second, mm -hmm. I think diabetes is mostly a psychological condition. I mean, obviously, what it is is an imbalance of sugar and or glucose and insulin. You got to take care of that because you don't make your own insulin. But that's fairly simple. It doesn't always make sense. And like I checked my blood sugar earlier today and it was 360. I had no idea it was that high. I have no idea why, but it just happens. Like physically, it's easy to take care of, basically, you know, it's just balancing those two things. But all of the psychological worry, that's what takes a bigger toll in some ways. Obviously, there are physical tolls. But so when people are worried about doing anything, I understand the worry because uh, you're going to go to a strange place. You don't know what the food is. You don't know, is there going to be uh, like a refrigerator for my insulin? Is there going to be, what if I break my insulin pen? What, how can I go to a clinic and buy a new one? How does all that work? But what I've found is that people will always help and there's no problem. There's not going to be any problems. People like healthcare is the same everywhere, no matter, it might be good or bad quality, but pe the, the people behind it are the same everywhere. They want to help. And if they realize that you are, if you can communicate somehow that you're diabetic and you need this, you need that, they'll do something. Uh, some, something will work, you know. Yeah. So I'd say just go. Just don't worry about it. Well, you have to plan to make sure you have enough insulin and stuff if you don't feel like buying it overseas. But there's not much to really worry about. It's all in your head. That's kind of basically my advice. Diabetes is the same when you're in a little guest house in the middle of Laos as it is when you're home. You still have to make sure that you had enough food and enough insulin and you have to check if you don't know. And it doesn't really change when you're on the road. What's next for you? Uh, you're in Japan right now. Are you planning any big trips? Are you going to stay there another four years? Not another four years. <laughs> um, <laughs> Going back to Aiken? Back to Aiken. <laughs> <laughs> would be an interesting uh, change. I'd love to visit Aiken. I don't know if I'm looking to move back to Aiken. <laughs> Small town in South Carolina, I should mention. <laughs> I just finished up a four-month trip to Europe, which was a lot of fun, kind of Eastern and Southern and Central Europe. And then I, I was actually in the States for a couple months. And then I just came back here in April. So I'm kind of here uh, refilling my coffers and teaching classes, you know, saving the next trip, which will probably, I hope, would start uh, about a year from now. But I don't know. Don't hold me to that. I would like to rent a car and just drive around the U.S., for two or three months going to see the national parks. Oh, wouldn't that be great? And I've seen some of them, and I've taken a few car trips across America with friends of mine, but um, I've missed a lot of, like I saw the Grand Canyon, but I didn't see a lot of the great national parks. Yosemite, I haven't seen. Uh, Yellowstone, I haven't seen. Things like that. So I have a big list, and I have a big Excel sheet with all of them. And that would kind of be my next trip. That sounds terrific. We did a small trip like that two years ago to the Grand Canyon and Bryce Canyon mm -hmm. and Zion. And mm -hmm. um, we were really nervous about diabetes. And uh, it worked out so well. And my takeaway from it has always been my son, we went on a mule ride. Um, you know, we were we were all on the mules on in Bryce Canyon. Mm -hmm. And he was, I want to say, seven or eight years old at the time. And I remember thinking, okay, we're going to be in this mule for two to three hours. You know, what are we going to do? Um, going low, going high. We weren't remote monitoring at the time. He wasn't even wearing a CGM. 
It worked out so well. We didn't worry about diabetes. We had a blast. And the pictures from that trip were just incredible. And it was so much fun. So I love that idea of just realize that diabetes is the same whether you're in your house or you're on a mule in Bryce Canyon. It really mm -hmm. is. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. Well, definitely keep in touch. This was really interesting. I'd love to talk to you again, especially if you wind up doing a trip through the States. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining me. All right. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Lots more information about Jeremy Larson. You've got to watch his YouTube channel. I will link it up at diabetes-connections.com. He also let me know that he's got a lot of videos from that park trip. He's in the process of uploading a lot of that stuff to YouTube. Apparently, he's redone a lot of his social media, and as many of us have since 2015. So that's getting uploaded. So please go ahead and check that out. And he said he has a few things up his sleeve for the next couple of months or years, you know, after coronavirus passes in Japan, which if you go just as an aside, if you go to his website and I, I watched a couple of the videos, it's been really interesting to see how Japan has handled coronavirus. You know, of course, they have had far fewer cases in the U.S. They handled the, the virus itself differently in terms of better masking and that kind of thing. But they have been slower on the vaccines. And Jeremy talks about the Japanese culture and kind of why that is. They are really just getting the vaccines rolling out now, several months after the U.S. It's just so interesting to get that perspective, right? I mean, travel is the greatest thing. You just, you learn so much. You open your mind. I can't wait to travel again. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for joining me. A couple of really fun and interesting episodes coming up, if I do say so myself. I'm not exactly sure which one I'm going to go with next week. Because it, as I'm speaking to you now, uh, scheduling is a bit up in the air. But here's what's coming up. I have a roundtable on sleepaway camp. This is non-diabetes sleepaway camp. So we're going to talk to two adults who went to this kind of camp when they were kids, two adults with type 1, and two parents, I'm one of the parents, who have children with type 1 that they have sent to regular sleepaway camp and kind of how to do it and, and what you can expect, that kind of thing. And we're also talking to the man who just set a record a brand new feat. He ran from Disney to Disney. He ran from Disneyland in California to Disney World in Florida. I am still working out the logistics, but Don promised me months ago that we would talk. So I'm hoping that will be the episode for next week. But that's really up to him. And boy, if anybody deserves a rest and a week in a hot tub, it's him. All right. Thank you, as always, to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here next week. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. <laughs>